letters by Kazimierz Gajgalas. Uh, these letters are extremely rare and extremely unusual. We have a two-page letter, which appears to be a transcript of letters that he sent to his wife and son. He was deported to the Risoti Gulag prison camp near Krasnoyarsk. His wife and son were another Siberian location near Tomsk, about 300 miles further. The eight transcribed letters we have date from October 21st, 1942 to July 21st, 1943. It appears that his wife sent these, saved these letters. They were eventually taken to Poland by his son and then transcribed and sent to Father Prunskis and, and to prepare the book, Lithuanians in Siberia. A Russian language was required at that time for letters and it is written in Russian and it was heavily censored. Mr. Gaigalas was 60 years old when he was deported. Before World War I, he worked on the Trans-Siberian Railroad for 12 years. During the war, he worked for a relief agency providing assistance to Russians who were injured. After the war ended, he returned to Lithuania where he worked as a farmer. He was elected to be the local alderman presumably because of his political appointment as alderman is the reason he was deported. The translation of the original Russian was done by Ms. Dangolia Potsute. October 21st, 1942. My dearest son and wife, yesterday I received two letters from you. I was overjoyed. I had thought that you both had perished. I asked everyone I could and no one knew anything. I received 400 to 600 grams of bread a day. Soup is twice, sometimes three times a day. How and when Borosevich died, I do not know since I was not home. Bimba, Strazdas, Shilekis, and Misunovas' husband all have died. I'm hurrying to write to you. Yesterday I received your letter, and today I'm writing back. I work at whatever comes my way. What do you, son, and your mother work at? Please write with strong, strong kisses, till we meet again. Jean's 32-year-old husband died. Father Frunsky, sister Anna, and her brother died. My distant relative, Kovaleski, also died. There are no more familiar faces. I'm very happy that you, my son, are studying well. I sold all of my extra clothes. It is very difficult for your poor mother, but what can you do if there are no warm clothes? Good that she was able to buy a jacket. It is also freezing here. I often see you in my dreams. When you receive this letter, please write. Your letters are the only joy in my life. My dear son and wife, do not forget me. Write more frequently. I've become very weak and I feel tired. If you could please send me a package, several kilograms dried potatoes, a kilogram of flour and some dried fish. Boil the potatoes, cut them up, and then dry them. Many people here receive packages with these kinds of potatoes. This would be tremendous support for me. Of course, do so only without depriving yourselves, if you can. Also, please send for letters. They announced that I've been sentenced to serve five years, ending on August 14th, 1946. My dearest son, I long for you and your mother so much that words cannot describe. Ah, my beloved, my precious. This fall I weighed 60 kilograms, now less. But how much less I do not know. It is unfortunate that packages are not allowed. If they were allowed, Please send me something. That would be tremendous support for me. I get 480 grams of bread a day and one and a half liters of soup a day. The area here is flat and forested. The ground is fertile. For you and your mother, it is more joyful. But for me, it is sad and lonely. You've only grown up. Your mother has gotten old. I frequently see you in my dreams. I wake up and you're gone. It was a dream, not reality. Son, what is the area like where you are? 
Is it flat or hilly? Is it far from Tomsk? Please, son, write frequently. Your letters are my only joy. July 21st, 1943. Dear son and wife, you wrote that it is possible to send a package, but something is not allowed. I asked the head of the prison camp, and he said that the package would be accepted for delivery if you wrote on it that you were sending it to a prisoner. If I were to receive a package from you, my health would certainly improve. Son, please go to the post office and inquire about this. If you do send a package, please include some salt. In my last letter, I did not write that I currently work censored fragment, and sometimes I sweep the yard. Kazimas Geigelas. The last letter was written on July 21st, 1943. He died three months later. The letters are brief, and there are censored fragments in them. Despite heavy censorship and incredibly harsh circumstances, uh, information about the massive death rates is covered in these letters that he sent. It is not clear whether he received any packages uh, from his wife. Elze Zimkevichiene. Uh, she is writing letters from the Kazachinsky region of Krosnoyarsk to Hedy, Yadzita, Chinek, and Cicero. In these letters, she describes her family's deportation to the high Arctic, to the delta of the Lena River to the Laptev Sea, which is a part of the Arctic Ocean. She inquires about two letters that she sent by registered airmail, which never arrived, and comments that she will only send letters by ordinary airmail. Given the sensitive materials she does mention in the surviving letters, and the active censorship of all mail, one can only guess at the content of the missing registered letters. In one letter, she enclosed dried flowers from Siberia. We were tossed far into the north of Yakutia near the Lena River on an island called Tit Ari. We were there 15 years. I think it is hard to envision the difficulties of living there. It was very difficult getting accustomed to the harsh climate. There were nine months of winter and basically no summer. Polar nights were long and the cold was severe. We had to survive the cold. I raised four sons, but none have married. In these circumstances, it is very difficult to find someone compatible with you. There was a severe shortage of warm clothing. In this climate, not having warm clothing made life extremely difficult. The primary occupation was fishing. At first, it was very difficult because I was not used to this kind of work and did not know my way around. But time heals everything. Little by little, I got used to it. During the last year there, I was a very good fisherwoman and even ended up on the year's honor roll. We had our own transport team, 12 reliable dogs and a sled. We fed them fish and porridge. We used their fur to make gloves and socks. There is no summer, but on warmer days, on the tundra, it is possible to find various berries. They grow right next to the earth and are similar to our raspberries. All vegetables here are dried. This is why we all suffer from scurvy. Fairly quickly after arriving here, we lost all our teeth. My husband worked various jobs. In the beginning, he worked as a lumberjack in the Altai region, then he built houses in the far north and remodeled them. Finally, he worked as a fisherman and studied weather phenomena. My husband has retired, but the pension he receives is very small, so he has to continue working. He can only work where it is warm, and so he stokes stoves. He works 12 hours a day, which tires him extremely. I wish Mary all the best fighting her illness because I myself have rheumatic inflammation of my joints, a consequence of the good life. Narkunas family. In these two photographs, Veronica Narkunas buries her two young children near the city of Barno in Siberia. In the top picture, four-year-old Livia Lucia Narkunaite is being buried. 
She was born in Lithuania and died on September 21, 1941, in Siberia. In the bottom picture, 16-month-old Zanonas Narkunas is being buried. He was born in Lithuania and died on September 22, 1941, in Siberia. On one September day, Veronica buried her four-year-old daughter and on the next day, her 16-month-old son. These young children survived only three months after their deportation in June 1941. These pictures were sent to A. Norkunas, who is living in Adelaide, Australia. Ona Pleoplenia. Uh, she was 71 years old. She's my grandmother uh, when she was deported to Siberia. She was a simple farm woman, and the crime that she committed was simply that she owned a small family farm. Her husband, Mateus Pleoplis, had died recently as a consequence of NKVD interrogations. Uh, she was sent across Nars to be a lumberjack. In the photograph, she stands sitting in front of one of the trees that she had chopped down. Uh, she was not a skilled person with axes. She had never had that experience before, and she was elderly. It's not surprising that within a few weeks, she had an accident and chopped herself in the leg. Um, she could barely walk as a consequence of that accident. It was life-saving. She was reassigned to different work. She was assigned to take care of a group of children, to raise them, to educate them, and to feed them. So she had access to heat, she had access to food. And so she survived the eight years that she was in Siberia. When I had a chance to meet her, um, when she arrived in the United States many decades later, she explained that during the winters, one third of all the residents would die from starvation and from the cold. The permafrost was solid frozen and the bodies were simply stacked up like uh, pieces of lumber, waiting until the spring thaw to, for the burials to take place. Uh, besides her, seven other uh, aunts and uncles, blood relatives of mine were deported to Siberia. In addition, my grand, both grandfathers, one great grandfather and one aunt all died as a consequence of NKVD interrogations. In all cases, the crime that they committed was that they owned small family farms. This was genocide on the basis of political motives. Zarunskis family. Zygmunt Zarunskis was 14 months old when he, with his family, were deported to Siberia. At the age of 14 years, instead of attending school, he was assigned to work as a lumberjack. While chopping trees, a limb fell down on him, killing him. The photograph was mailed to a relative in Jackson Heights, New York. In it, standing from left to right, are Zygmunt's parents, Pranus and Ona, his younger brother Jonas, who was born in Siberia, and his older sister Zita, 